Okay? So what's with the thawb and the uh, qamis and sarwal yasr on it? Um, culturally, they're, they're the only um, representation of um, Muslims or Muslims from, uh, I guess you could say, uh, whichever area the quote comes from, that can, that can maybe <coughs> distinguish someone as a Muslim. Okay. Which is also an assumption. It is an assumption based on what? I mean, the, what, what makes it a culturally representation? What makes a dress like a thawb or so what? How did the Prophet dress, by the way? Did the Prophet have this sirwan of qamis? You know? Did he have this hooded things that the Moroccans, you know, wear? I had those like, I know the, they know the they gifts. What? They dressed in whatever they gifts they give. So the Prophet, Ali Hassatu, was to them dressed, this is a key point, the Prophet dressed where, the Prophet wore whatever was available. So the Prophet dressed like a member of his own culture. That's what the Prophet did, alayhi salatu wasalam. That's what whatever was available, the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, wore. That's what he did. So long as the Islamic guidelines are met. After that, it's up to you how you would wear them. Now, sometimes the problem sometimes with promoting the sirwal and qamis or whatnot as an Islamic symbol, it gives the impression of Islam being a cultural religion or a religion that is meant for a certain group of people. In other words, for you to be a Muslim, you have to be connected with that particular nationality or that particular culture, which is wrong. Islam came to accommodate all of that. That's why the Prophet, what makes something a sunnah? What makes something a sunnah? It doesn't mean if a Prophet did it, it automatically it's called a sunnah. A sunnah is something that the Prophet did as a means to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Prophet rode camels, right? It doesn't mean riding camels is a sunnah. So it means that you get more reward if you ride camels. So there are certain things that the Prophet did والسلام, that are part of his culture. And, at that, and these actually, if you want to do them, it's up to you. But you cannot preach them as part of the teachings of the Prophet So there are certain things about the garments that the Prophet said. That's why if there is like the color. Which color? You know, does it have to be this or that? Now the Prophet والسلام, only praised one color as far as the dress of, of the men. And he said, anybody knows the hadith? He said that the best of your garments are the white. Communist. <laughs> white is communist? White and gray. No, no, no. Well, let's not <laughs> listen. No, no, this, these are teachings of the Prophet, <laughs> let's not just make joke. Well, Allah, very quick. So the Prophet والسلام, said that the best of your garments are the white, so wear them and then wrap or shroud your dead with them. And that's why the kafan of the dead person is white because of that hadith. Now, it doesn't mean the Prophet only wore white, however. So the Prophet praised white, but the Prophet wore other colors as well. So which means if there was any favor as far as garment is concerned, it is the color white. And that's why, by the way, the ihram garment, when you go to Hajj and Umrah, they're white. They don't have to be white, by the way. You can, even, I'm talking about the men. You can have a blue. Uh, thing you can have a it doesn't matter you know it doesn't mean that your ihram will not be valid so the reason we wear the white and ihram because of the hadith of the prophet but the prophet did wear other colors as well so here what i'm trying to say is that the way the person dresses will be up to the culture will be up to the culture that he's part of and the prophet dressed in a way to uh to be part of his surroundings, so he did not stand out in a way. That's what the Prophet did. He he just uh, how what's the word? He uh, adapted. What? Adapted. No, no, no. He no. blended. He blended. <laughs> he blended. You know, among he blended with his people. So that's why I mean that's why the Prophet Ali Sallallahu when he arrived to Medina, people didn't know which one is Abu Bakr, which one was the Prophet, right? Those that didn't know him, because he was dressed like him, so he didn't have special kind of garments. That's what the Prophet dressed like a member of his own culture. So long as, again, the Islamic guidelines are taken in there. But sometimes you have to send out. Yeah, for example, you cannot tell the sister, you have to take your hijab off to blend in. No, there are, there, there are actually some Islamic guidelines that have to be followed. But the point here is that this does not have to be, or we, don't, we should not associate that with an Islamic identity. Now, with that said, there's nothing wrong if a person likes to wear a, a thawb. There's nothing wrong with that, absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think it may add to the interests of the character, you know. That's why, but we cannot promote it as part of the Islamic uh, uh, culture or Islamic identity. That you have to wear a certain color, or promoting a certain color, or for example, promoting a certain uh, kind of garments. No, that is up to the culture. 
And having a cultural identity does not contradict with having an Islamic identity. Because sometimes when we go to two extremes, one extreme you have people that just want to lose the Islamic identity altogether. And then they say, in other words, no, 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 just like forget about this. You know, this is the extreme. And the other extreme, some brothers or sisters that will say, no, I cannot say, for example, I come from a Lebanese origin or a Pakistani origin. I'm only Islamic, or I only have this Islamic identity, which is also the other extreme. Because the Prophet ﷺ indicated who he was related to, right? He says, Allah chose Quraysh from Banu Ismail and Qunana Bani Quraysh, and Allah chose me from Banu Hashim. So the Prophet indicated his lineage, alayhi salatu wasalam, even though his lineage was not Islamic, right? I mean, his tribes and his forefathers. That's why there's nothing wrong with identifying yourself as to who you are. This is part of who you are. And among the Sahaba of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, Salman, the great Salman, he was identified as Salman al Farisi, Salman the Persian, right? So you cannot say, no, no, I cannot say, for example, that, well, I'm so-and-so and I come from a, a Palestinian, Syrian background or whatnot. No, there's nothing wrong with saying that. There's nothing wrong. Because that's what you know. <coughs> and Islam does not ask you to erase your identity. Salman was known as a Pharisee. Suhaib was known as a Rumi. You know, uh, Abu Musa was known as an Ash'ari. Abu Ayyub was known as an Ansari. That's, that's how they got their titles. Khalid al Walid al Makhzumi. So they were identified by their lineage. There's nothing wrong with that, so long as it does not contradict with the Islamic identity. Yes, Ram. Earlier you said um, it is not considered sunnah um, for the Prophet to have ridden the camel. It doesn't, just because the Prophet rode the camel does not mean a sunnah to ride yes. the camel. But, but then again, <clears throat> why, why do I so commonly hear it is sunnah to learn how to ride a horse? Well, the Prophet, there are certain things. Now, even that hadith, by the way, there are certain, what makes something a sunnah, not just that the Prophet did it. If the Prophet did something, what that indicates, and the fiqh, by the way, it indicates that it is mubah, it is allowed, it is halal to do. If the Prophet did it. Now, what takes it to the level higher than mubah, into the level of being recommended into a sunnah, that's if the Prophet praises it. If the Prophet praises this action, or if the Prophet says, do this. Now, that definitely takes it to the level of sunnah, or even fard sometimes. And the Prophet said it. So the Prophet did say that, did indicate riding the horse. But some they said that this is an indication of preparing you know, for strength and whatnot. It may not be literally for the horse. But that's a good question. So when the Prophet sometimes praises something, or the Prophet says, do this, or the Prophet you know, does something on a regular basis, now that may take it into the level higher than just mubah or allowed, into recommended or even required. So again, back to the culture versus the Islamic identity. So if something is wrong in one culture, it would be wrong in all culture. So we don't say, for example, that, take a figure, you know, uh, uh, a certain celebrity, American celebrity, give me a name. Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga. <laughs> let's say, for example, we don't say that, <coughs> let's say, uh, uh, Nancy Ashram is halal and Lady Gaga is haram. <laughs> You know, he's a Lebanese singer, you know. No, subhanAllah, I mean, both of them could be haram or both of them could be halal if they're halal. That's why whatever is halal is halal in all the culture, whatever is haram is haram in all the culture. So it doesn't mean that it's just by merely belonging to a certain culture, it would make it automatically halal or automatically haram to say that everything that comes from the French culture, for example, is automatically haram. No, it doesn't mean that. If it contradicts an Islamic teaching, or American culture, or Italian culture, or any other culture, then it will be halal. If it does not, it will be haram. That's why, because Islam did not come for one particular culture. Islam came to accommodate all of that. That's why Islam has the ability to accommodate all of these different cultures within its folds, and does not promote one specific model, does not promote one specific culture. That's why there's nothing wrong with saying, for example, I'm an American Muslim, I'm an English Muslim, I'm a Palestinian American Muslim, um, you know, whatever combinations you have, there's nothing wrong with that. And Islam does not ask you to erase your cultural identity. Actually, your cultural identity makes you interesting. You know, imagine if everybody's exactly a carbon copy of one another. It'd be very boring. That's why it colors it up. It colors your, your identity, who you are, your, your, your cultural identity. And Islam did not come to erase that. Islam did not come to erase that. So the rule here is that Islamic identity can accommodate all of the cultural identities and acknowledge them, so long as they do not contradict the Islamic identity. That's why at the more basic level you have the Islamic identity. 
And that's the thing that deserves the consideration. So the second level, the cultural, if it fits within the first one, then I would accept it. If it does not, no, I would compromise on the cultural and not on the Islamic. I would compromise on the cultural aspect and not on the Islamic aspect. Any, any question or comment so far? So there's nothing more Islamic about uh, what is it called? CP, not CPK. Yeah. Uh, CTM. CTM. <laughs> <laughs> about chicken tikka masala. There's nothing more Islamic uh, anymore than about pizza or about shawarma or falafel or anything else that you have in mind. I'm sorry, I zoned down when I heard shawarma. Yeah, shawarma has a special status. <laughs> it brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Really? Well, because you thank Allah when you eat it. It's so beautiful. It's so tasty, right? I guess... I guess my question is, how do you explain to people who may not understand like, how it's better to compromise more on the culture than the Islamic? Because a lot of people who, like I said, are old-fashioned, they yes. tend to focus a lot on the culture. And sometimes if you try to tell them compromise on culture, I think the Islamic comes off as disrespectful. Exactly. That's a good question. Right. You heard the question? Anybody heard the question? Repeat it. Repeat it for the camera. That's pretty long, dude, but okay. <laughs> uh, normally when people say that it's more important to focus on culture rather than Islam and you want to explain to them how you should compromise on culture rather than Islam, it comes off to them as disrespectful, so how do you go about doing that? Well, like, this is a choice that has to be made by the people themselves as to what is more important to them. For some people, the culture is more important than the religion. I mean, not everybody actually cares about their religion the way you do. That's why for some people, religion is just something on the side, so to speak. So anyway, culture becomes more important. This is the reality of things. You cannot enforce other measures on these people. So it's up to the person. But sometimes people fail to see that. You know, in a way, to them, maybe religion is the most important, but they end up compromising. And I think it has to be explained. That's why what determines something to be part of the Islamic identity or not is really the, the, you know, the sources.